regulation of water balance, um, gastrointestinal regulation, oral intake accounts for most of the water that we bring in. Right? Uh, small amounts of water are eliminated by gastrointestinal tract and the feces. If you have diarrhea or you're vomiting, of course, then you can have a lot of more loss of, of fluid and electrolytes uh, <clears throat> through the feces or through the, from the GI. If you have diarrhea and vomiting, uh, of course, that can lead to a lot more uh, loss of fluids and electrolytes from the GI tract. Insensible water loss, uh, invisible vaporization from the lungs and skin. Uh, <clears throat> you lose about 500 to 1,000 uh, mLs a day from insensible water loss, and no electrolyte loss through insensible water loss, just water loss. So uh, the thing probably to know about this is, or to be thinking about when you're doing this, is it's something that when you're doing INOs that you might have to take keep track of. Another thing is uh, when a person is hyperventilating, they're breathing real fast, right? You're losing it through vaporization. You're losing water through uh, invisible vaporization from the lungs. So uh, somebody hyperventilating is going to be more at risk for dehydration than somebody who's breathing at a normal rate. Gerontologic considerations. Your kidney, the kidneys of uh, the elderly are a decreased ability to conserve water. Hormonal changes can lead to decrease in renin and aldosterone and increase in ADH and uh, uh, ANP, uh, atrial nitritic peptide. Um, so hopefully you all know what you know what those things are. I uh, well there is a, uh, a video. I have a video on aldosterone and ADH and uh, nitritic peptide. Uh, that's ANP or BNP. Uh, sometimes they'll call it brain nitratic peptides, but aldosterone, right, causes the reabsorption of sodium and uh, water follows sodium. ADH causes the reabsorption of sodium, right, antidiuretic hormone, causes uh, uh, reabsorption of just water. Okay, so reabsorption of sodium, water comes with it, just reabsorption absorption of water with ADH. A and P reverses the uh, aldosterone uh, effects, right? It, it, uh, so another thing to consider in the elderly is they have less subcutaneous tissue uh, and this, uh, uh, you have more uh, moisture loss through the skin, the, the vaporization through the skin. <clears throat> more things to know. Reduced thirst mechanism results in decreased fluid intake, so they don't know that they're thirsty. Functional changes uh, affect the ability to independently obtain fluids, right? A lot of times it's a good idea to let elderly know, you know, they can fill up a pitcher or something and bring it into their room with them uh, so that they can drink uh, more readily instead of having to go through the arduous task of going out and getting the water. And nurse must assess for these changes and implement treatments accordingly. So orthostatic hypotension, uh, when somebody is dehydrated, they're more likely to have orthostatic hypotension. Orthostatic hypotension means when they change uh, positions, right? They don't have the fluid to, 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 uh, to get it to return back up to the brain, so they've been lying, they've been sitting, the fluid is out on their feet, and it doesn't get up into their brain, they get lightheaded and pass out, fall over. <clears throat> so they need to know that they need to dangle their feet. Underline dangle, something like that. So that's a word that uh, they like to use in your book. Okay, extracellular fluid volume deficit. If you have abnormal loss of normal body fluids, inadequate intake or plasmid interstitial fluid uh, shifts. So this is how you can end up with hypovolemia. This is ways that you can get these fluid imbalances. Uh, you're losing more water than you should, right? You're not taking enough in, so you're not drinking enough, uh, or you've got the plasma to interstitial fluid shifts. So your abnormal water loss might be diarrhea or something like that, or you might be out in the, out in the desert or something, right? You're, you're losing it all through your skin. Um, inadequate intake, um, for some reason you're not able to get to the water and so you're not drinking it. Um, and plasma to interstitial fluids, what causes that? Why would you have plasma to interstitial fluids? Shifts, right? Water is moving from your plasma, it's moving into the interstitial, right into the tissues. Um, you know, when you get inflammation, right? Somebody stomps on my stomps on my thumb, right? I'm down on the floor. Somebody stomps on my thumb. It gets swelled up, right? 
and that gets swelled up because you get inflammation. Histamine is released. It's one of the one of the inflammatory messengers out there. It causes all of the all of the uh, vessels there in my thumb will vasodilate, so more fluid can get into it to do to get the white blood cells in there and stuff and, and try to fix whatever it is or fight whatever pathogen is there and the, the vessels also get leaky. So more fluid to that those dilated vessels, the vessels are leaky so it goes out into the interstitial space and then I get a big swollen thumb, right? Well if that happens in my vessels all over the body like somebody that has uh, uh, sepsis or something, yeah sepsis is a good enough, a great example then you might have you might have this inflammatory process going all over the body uh, and when that happens uh, the fluid will shift uh, from our our fluids our, our vessels and so when that happens the we get vasodilation all over our body vaso increase in vasopermeability all over our body so fluid is shifting our vessels are bigger and fluid is shifting out of them all over our body so we end up with hypovolemia we have the same amount of fluid in our soul system but it's not in our vascular system where we need it. So we get this. So we've got that uh, plasma to interstitial fluid shift. Uh, clinical manifestations related to loss of vascular volume as well as CNS uh, effects. <clears throat> Treatment: replace water and electrolytes with balanced IV solutions. Right? Good to know stuff for confusion. I, I just I made this because it's things that I wanted to tell you that weren't necessarily in other slides. So. Applying uh, oxygen uh, stat can reduce confusion, even if perfusion is still less than optimal. So um, a lot of times you might see questions in NCLEX or wherever, even a questions that I give you, that might talk about uh, <clears throat> what do you want to do with this, with this patient. And you might think, well, I want to turn up their fluids right away. That's, I want to run right to the fluid and increase it. Or do you want to give them some oxygen? Probably giving them some oxygen is probably going to be your first thing to do, right? Increase the oxygen intake because even though you're not perfusing well, let's get the, the blood that does perfuse into the brain or wherever that it's perfu that you're perfusing oxygen rich blood, right? So it's, the perfusion might not be uh, fixed right away but with that, but if your blood that does get in there is going to be more oxygenated, right? So, so applying oxygen is a valid treatment. Um, and the, the second one here, the main reason I put in there is that, that you realize that uh, uh, when it comes to fluid replacement, it's based on INO, right? And there is, you can't just give it all. You say, oh, they need a liter because they're a liter short. You don't just give them a liter, boom. So you do have to give it down here, however it says here. Uh, <clears throat> oh, it's down here. Two to four ounces of fluid every hour. But the big, big thing is know that it's based on INO. I'm sorry, it's down here that I'm talking about now. So uh, you're based your rehydration by your INO, how much they're taking in compared to how much they're they're uh, they're putting out, and then you know how much that you have to replace. Uh, monitor your fluid loss or gain. And the, the thing that this one's about is weight, right? You weigh your patients uh, in like circumstances, like every morning at the same time with the same amount of clothing before they eat, or you know, so that. So that you're not comparing apples to oranges, you want to to weigh it like that. But daily weights are probably the easiest and most indicative way to to figure out if a person is losing or gaining fluid. So INOs monitor cardiovascular changes. So when you're implementing, you want to look watch, look and see if there's any cardiovascular changes. One big thing is if you end up with hypovolemia. You might, you are going to have problems like, right, your blood pressure is going to drop because you don't have enough fluid in your system, and probably your pulse rate is going to go up, right? So that's a couple of changes that you're going to monitor for. Assess respiratory uh, changes, right, always. Uh, neurological changes because perfusing the brain, that could change. So you got to you got to keep an eye on what their neurological status is. And daily weights. Daily weights is the most easily obtained and accurate means for assessing volume status, right? Uh, and then skin assessment, right? You can look for turgor, and that's right there. Showing turgor, hopefully everybody knows what turgor is. If you get tenting like that, it's a sign of dehydration. Okay, so hypernatremia. Hypernatremia, manifestations, thirst, lethargy, agitation, seizures, and coma. Impaired level of consciousness, uh, symptoms of fluid, vo fluid volume deficit. <clears throat> 
management of hypernatremia. <clears throat> Treat the underlying cause because it would be different reasons. Uh, prime, if you have a primary water deficit, uh, replace the fluids orally. In other words, if you're losing the fluid, you might have high sodium just because of hemoconcentration, right? You've got less water in there, so it makes your sodium level, the concentration of sodium, higher in your, in your uh, blood. So in that case, you want to give them some uh, isotonic or hypotonic fluids, right? Um, yeah, so excess sodium, um, if they have too much sodium in there, but they have no sign of hypovolemia, so you don't really suspect hemoconcentration uh, as being the uh, problem, then you need to dilute this with uh, some sodium-free uh, IV fluids and promote excretion with diuretics. So you don't want to overload them, so you can go ahead and give them some fluids and then give them diuretics of that fluid, so you're kind of flushing them out is what you're doing. And diuretics will lower your potassium and your sodium and your calcium and your magnesium. Um, so And then monitor them carefully. you got to keep a, a close eye on where on how they sit because if you uh, if you overcorrect with this hype with the hypotonic fluid you know you can go from them having hypernatremia to being hyponatremic. Okay here's another little slide that I just kind of made and I don't think you're going to be able to read it on there. Uh, and what it says, clients on restricted sodium diets generally should avoid processed, smoked, and pickled foods. And uh, those uh, with sauces and other condiments. So there's a lot of sodium in that stuff, obviously. And most prepackaged foods have a high sodium content. That's something that you need to remember, right? Uh, that's probably the most important thing that you can tell somebody on a sodium, uh, on a low sodium diet. If they're in a sodium restriction, Always read the boxes, right, when you get these processed and the canned, canned foods too. Uh, you need to know how much sodium is in there because this sodium really increases the shelf life of food. So, and they found ways to put a lot of sodium in there and still make it taste decent. Uh, the amount of sodium that they put in some of this stuff, if you were putting that on your food, it would taste horrible and you wouldn't eat it. But they find ways of, of uh, altering the sodium or... or mixing it with certain other things that take away from the strong sodium flavoring and that way it still t tastes decent but you're getting a hell of a lot of sodium when you when you eat the stuff so that's an important thing something to know right teach your patients to read uh, food labels okay Mary is a 62 year old female who was, was admitted with confusion and lethargy related to hyponatremia her husband tells you that she had a complaints of diarrhea <clears throat> over the last week, past week and was drinking a lot of water to prevent dehydration. Well, that's good, right? a lot of water because you're losing a lot of water, right? But what caused her to have a, this a low sodium level? Well, this is what's happened, right? She's lost an isotonic fl uh, fluid, right? It's uh, fluid, and in an isotonic fluid, you're going to have sodium and potassium and all this stuff, right? It's a body fluid, so it's more than likely isotonic. Um, but she's replacing it with, with hypotonic fluid, just water, right? So she's taking in all of this water while she's losing all of this water and sodium and whatever. So she ended up with a low concentration of sodium. As you admit Mary to the nursing unit, you develop an individualized plan of care. Identify appropriate nursing diagnosis for Mary. Well, let's see what they got here. Acute confusion risk for injury, risk for electrolyte imbalance, potential complications would be severe neurologic changes. So uh, what interventions would we have? Well if she is uh, hemodiluted they might put her on a fluid restriction, right? Um, let Go ahead and let her eat sodium and food and stuff and then there's not quite as much fluid in there. Um, that's if it's mild. Or they might actually give her some sodium uh, some sodium supplements. Uh, there's salt tablets, things like that. Uh, now, what if her, her, if she had severe symptoms, like or maybe she was going to seizure or close to coma or severely confused? So, if she had a lot of really bad uh, symptoms and neurologic problems, uh, they might go ahead and give uh, an IV of uh, sodium containing flu. A lot of times, they, I mean, they might even give 3% sodium. 3% sodium, right? Well, 0.9% is normal saline. So 0.9% uh, sodium chloride is an isotonic uh, 
fluid. 3% is a hypertonic fluid because there's a lot more sodium chloride in that than what we normally have and it's, and it's a hypertonic fluid so you're going to have to be careful. Remember back when we looked at the red blood cells and we talked about how they shrink? That's what you got to be careful of. So you're going to have to give it slowly and then you're going to have to monitor that patient. Monitor the patient for neurologic changes. Monitor their lungs, right? It's super important. Abnormal fluid loss, fluid replacement with sodium containing solutions. Um, aldosterone antagonist. So this is spironolactone. It's a, is a potassium sparing diuretic. Now if you remember from farm class, uh, spironolactone or sp uh, uh, aldosterone antagonists. If you remember from farm class, aldosterone is uh, aldosterone is a hormone released from the adrenal gland that acts on the uh, tubules in the kidney to reabsorb sodium. You reabsorb sodium, and water comes with it, so it will it will rehydrate you. So patients with this, patients should be taught to choose foods apple juice uh, rather than uh, foods higher in, with higher levels of potassium such as citrus fruits and uh, it's a good idea anyway to uh, not have people uh, take their pills with citrus fruits especially grapefruit uh, yeah so the reason you avoid uh, citrus fruits and, and especially uh, grapefruit juice you don't that's not what you want to wash your pills down with uh, and a lot of pill bottles will say no grapefruit juice uh, or no citrus fruit juice while you're taking this medication <clears throat> and the reason is because it destroys some of the uh, uh, enzymes in the colon or in the uh, intestines you've got a, you've got this medicine and it has a narrow uh, therapeutic range right so so it can't you don't want a whole lot of it you, you've got to get at least this much and this much and get just a little bit more than that and you end up in the toxic range right and so they have to give you, a, so it's pretty specific as to how much you have to take. Well, the problem is, is you got this, en you got this enzyme, it's got some weird name, but this enzyme in your intestines that destroys a lot of this medicine. So they give you a lot more than what you really need because they know maybe 80% of this medicine is going to be destroyed in the, in the gut before it gets into the person. So you're getting 80% more in that pill. Well, you take, when you drink orange juice, or I should say grapefruit juice for sure, but avoid orange juice too, because it'll do the same thing it, to a lesser extent, but it can destroy these, uh, these enzymes that destroy that. So now you got this extra 80% going into your system. So you can, it, it's to the point where it, it, in, it, where it could uh, kill you. I mean, and it can severely overdose a person if they drink grapefruit juice or orange juice with it.